I'd like to add my welcome to everybody who's uh, here online today. We really appreciate your, your coming to attend this session and any of the other sessions that we have lined up for today and tomorrow. So without further ado, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to my colleague, uh, Dr. Zoe Plakias. Uh, Zoe is an assistant professor in our department. Uh, she got her PhD in agricultural economics at UC Davis, and she's doing a lot of work on local foods, food security, food prices. You might have even seen her interview on television recently and on US Farm Report. So without further ado, Zoe's going to talk to us about consumers, shopping, and local food. What's next? Well, thank you so much, Ian. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this morning on this, uh, this rainy and gray morning. Um, uh, glad to have you with us. And uh, for those who are watching the recording later, thank you for um, finding your way uh, to this recording. And, and we're excited um, that you, you have found it and are watching it. So um, I'm going to uh, jump right in. Um, and uh, then I encourage, we're going to leave quite a bit of time at the end for questions. So um, I, uh, I look forward to your questions. I do see some familiar, some familiar, familiar uh, names uh, and, uh, and look forward to hearing from those of you who I don't know as well. So our agenda today for the next little while is uh, to talk about these five things. First, I want to take stock of consumer prices. Why? Because it seems like I have gotten what four or five media requests probably in the last couple of weeks uh, about consumer prices. Everyone's concerned about this leading into the holidays. Um, and, uh, and so we wanna just kind of address that head on. Second, I wanna explore a little bit about what's happening in our food supply chains and how this is um, affecting uh, what people are seeing at the grocery store, both in terms of prices um, and in terms of inventory. Next, uh, as Ian mentioned, uh, a lot of my work focuses on local food, regional food systems, and uh, short and direct supply chains. And so we're going to zoom in on that a little bit and talk about what's happening in that space. Uh, then I want to jump to the new normal. What is it? How do we get there? Um, and then look ahead to what's next. So like I said, we're going to dive in first uh, to consumer prices. So uh, local prices for food at home are high. Um, this is uh, from uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve. So this is the consumer price index for all urban consumers. Um, and this is the food at home in the US city average. And you see uh, this line is uh, creeping up. That gray bar represents um, that early part of the pandemic when we were in lockdown. Okay, but you can see um, that uh, prices have been rising. And this is a major story um, that we are we are hearing um, all over the place. So what is happening? Um, why are food prices so high right now? Well, I attribute this to five different things I'm going to talk about. So the first is economic recovery. It's actually a bright spot, a good thing. Uh, the second is supply chain disruptions, which I'll also cover a little bit more later in the talk. The third is the location of demand then we have the unpredictability of demand and we just have consumer anxiety, which we may have all felt at some point recently um, wearing our consumer hats. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about economic recovery. Again, this is from the uh, Federal Reserve. We um, see we have data through quarter three of 2020 run right now, and this is a real gross domestic product. So you can see that we had this um, downward kind of spike and um, have largely uh, recovered from that in terms of our gross domestic product, which is a, a measure of economic activity. So there are signs of economic recovery. What is that? Well, that is a good sign. Um, and we are seeing that consumers are buying. Um, initially, we saw that folks who um, were working from home were shifting their buying right to um, all of the kind of accoutrement you need to work from home. Um, I'm sure some of us have experienced that as we're all here on our, our computers today. Um, but in addition, um, we have continued to see, um, you know, uh, returns um, to uh, other types of spending, including um, food away from home and other um, types of activities. So food away from home would be restaurants, eating out, for example. However, we 
a big story, right, as well have been supply chain disruption. So um, this is um, suppliers delivery times um, from IHS market. Um, and uh, these, uh, these sources are hyperlinked. Um, so when the slides are posted, uh, I encourage you to take a look at these links and you can dig into the data yourself if you would like. Um, so suppliers delivery times have slowed particularly um, in the US, the Eurozone and the UK. Okay, and so we are hearing about this a lot where we're experiencing some of the impacts of this um, where things uh, that we're hoping to purchase um, may, uh, may be delayed. Interestingly, if you dig into this by sector, uh, beverages and food are the least affected, um, but these industries do need other intermediate goods. So one thing that's important to recognize is even if you think, well, gosh, you know, is food really coming in containers on a ship? Well, even if the food is not, other inputs, um, parts for uh, machines that are used to produce that food may be. So um, this can still cause um, challenges uh, in, our, in our supply chains. So you can see that um, every sector is experiencing longer, uh, longer times, okay, but um, food and beverage is actually the lowest. Also, when we look to, I, I did mention that food uh, away from home spending is recovering, um, but it did plunge in 2020. It did, it did go down. Many of us, um, I, I'm guessing, I'm certainly not, are not back to our kind of pre-pandemic um, level of uh, eating out, eating at restaurants, um, eating um, in uh, institutional settings, right? And so um, this is something uh, that has been a challenge um, because it's really about the location of demand, right? The location of demand has been changing. So early in the pandemic, during the lockdowns, um, we were seeing that people were eating a lot um, at home and purchasing from grocery stores rather than eating out. We have seen some recovery of that, as I mentioned, um, which is not yet quite captured um, by this data set from the USDA. Um, but uh, we're not back to those pre-pandemic uh, levels. And so that location of demand has changed and it means that um, folks uh, have had to, um, folks in the supply chain uh, have had to adjust to where that, where that demand uh, is rather than where it was. Now this trend of food away from home um, kind of uh, decreasing, right? Holds across all locations where people eat out when we look 2019 to 2020. Now you might say, hey, it's November 2021. That's a great point. Um, we don't have as much data yet for 2021, and, and I'm hopeful um, that, uh, that I can update um, this talk uh, in the spring with some more of that information. So here we go. We see that full service restaurants, hotels, recreational places, drinking places all saw very large double digit decreases okay, in spending um, 2020 relative to 2019. Some other places limited serve service restaurants, for example, this would be, um, you know, uh, where you would do drive-throughs, right, or, or some kind of service where you didn't have as much human interaction, so there's less risk. Some of those decreased less, as well as institutions where we maybe had a little bit more stability, but they're all negative numbers here. Now here's where consumers were shopping in 2020. So we see that the yellow is negative, the blue is positive. So grocery stores, warehouse clubs, um, and super centers, uh, mail, mail order and home delivery really increased. Um, and there's also a large increase in direct selling. Um, and so that's where we saw um, food at home spending increase in 2020 relative to 2019. And we saw convenience stores, mass merchandisers, and other stores and food service um, with a decrease in food at home spending in, in 2020 relative to 2019. Now, again, in 2021, a lot of this has moderated a bit, but we are not yet back to a pre-pandemic uh, pattern. Now, I also mentioned that there's an unpredictability of demand that is very challenging for businesses. Now, I like this simple chart from SCM Global, which is a um, supply chain management uh, consultancy, because it, it really shows some of the key pieces that are uh, challenged right now. So um, businesses are having to determine what, how, and when to produce, um, how much to make and how much to stock, where best to do what activity, how and when to move product, and then they use information as the basis for making these decisions. Well, it's difficult to kind of back out what to produce if you don't know what exactly consumers will be buying, where they'll be buying it, and when they'll be buying it. 
In addition, inventory needs are changing as, um, as supply chain kind of challenges are affecting food markets. So all of this has kind of been upended and the predictability which our supply chains run on has been uh, challenged. And so this is hard uh, for businesses. Now, this is from a McKinsey and Company report in early 2020, and I bet these authors are kicking themselves that they did not um, have the pandemic on here. I added COVID on the far right, okay, where I uh, thought it would, it would go. Um, there is uh, kind of, I think, widespread uh, feeling that this is uh, a black swan event and falls into this category. So you see on the horizontal axis, there's the magnitude of the risk impact. Um, so it's going up as you go um, from uh, left to right. And on the vertical axis, there's the ability to anticipate this. So going from medium to uh, on the, the bottom to, to low up high. Uh, so we're in the situation with high risk um, and it, has, it, it was difficult to anticipate. Hopefully we are getting better uh, at that as we kind of understand um, more what the patterns of transmission are um, and what's happening in our supply chains, but it continues to, to be uh, a challenge. And you can see at the same time, there are lots of other uh, challenges that continue to, um, to be an issue. Um, we've had some hurricanes. Uh, we did have some uh, cyber uh, um, uh, attack issues this year. We had, uh, we've just had some major flooding in uh, mainland uh, British Columbia and Northwest Washington. Um, I'm sure my colleague Ian Sheldon will uh, discuss Brexit and tariff, uh, tariffs between the U.S. and China and uh, his talk uh, on international trade. And uh, we've had uh, continuing, I'm going to talk a little bit about labor um, and regulatory challenges as well. So we can see that all of this um, is happening during the pandemic, not just COVID. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about consumer anxiety. Um, one thing that I've been trying to assure people um, when I've been doing media interviews recently is that we do have more than enough food in the United States. Uh, the challenge is getting it to where people want it when they want it. And, uh, and so concerns, right, when we have a, 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 a food system that usually gets things where you want it when you want them, and when that doesn't happen, it's scary. And uh, that's concerning. And so one of the ways that people have responded to that is by stockpiling. And so um, this is from uh, summer 2021. So during the kind of height of uh, the Delta variant, which may have surprised some of us um, kind of rearing its head in the summer, when we thought that we would kind of be getting back to normal by now. And so you can see um, that uh, there are definitely concerns here. So uh, more than 30% of people said that they were concerned that products wouldn't be in stock when needed. Um, folks are concerned about prices going up, concerned about going to the store, um, concerned about running low on the contents of their stockpile. Now, what are people stockpiling? Well, they reported still stock. Uh, Piling toilet paper, if you thought that that trend was just for early 2020, seems to still be here, um, and other kind of uh, sanitizing products. But we also see for food products um, that uh, that canned goods and pasta um, also uh, really made it made it up there. Um, so these are you know shelf stable food products that we can stockpile um, in our pantries and can sit there for for quite a long time. Um, we can pull them out uh, as needed. You also see beer, wine, and spirits. Uh, baby products, pet food is up there, right? Um, of course, we have all seen a, a host of, um, of uh, pet adoptions as well um, that have occurred uh, during the pandemic. So these are all contributing to what we are seeing with consumers. And unfortunately, the stockpiling behavior that folks see, um, that folks engage in, um, in response to concerns about stockouts, which are this temporarily empty shelves in grocery stores, um, and uh, their you know, observations of price increases is this, this response of stockpiling actually exacerbates the issues that we already see. Um, so we, we do know that early in the pandemic, there were limits that you know, Kroger and other places were putting on you know, the number of toilet paper packages you could get, the number of rolls of paper towels, the number of um, hand sanitizers, et cetera. Um, and so uh, we, I, I have not um, seen uh, some of those limits related to, uh, to food products. I think that might concern some people, um, but, uh, but I would encourage people to only um, purchase what they need um, um, if these rising prices and stockouts are a concern. 
Okay, now let's move on um, to talking uh, a little bit about um, supply chains. So every part, this is, I'm a broken record on this. Um, when people ask me about supply chains and what's going on in supply chains right now, I say, well, every part of the supply chain with humans is impacted. <laughs> and so if you said, gosh, Zoe, it looks like you put a red check mark next to every single part of the supply chain. You are correct. I did because humans are literally part of every part of our, our food supply chain. So um, while they may play uh, more or less of a role in certain places, um, they do play a role everywhere. And so it's important for us to to recognize um, that uh, if it takes five or six of these kind of boxes and arrows for food uh, to get from uh, the producer uh, to our home and to our refrigerator, um, then there are opportunities uh, for, for, uh, for delays and challenges at every single uh, point there in each of those boxes, right? And I just want to emphasize that because it's not necessarily true that one thing is going terribly wrong in one place, it can be that lots of little things are happening in lots of places and that they compound. And, uh, and we see that as something uh, very concerning, maybe something isn't on the shelf when we want it, uh, but really it's, it's the um, kind of combination of lots of smaller issues. Now, um, one thing that I want to, um, to really emphasize is that COVID has impacted workers, right? Just like I just said, humans are everywhere in the supply chain. Humans have been impacted by COVID. Um, this is a really um, interesting uh, set of graphs, and I have another slide on this too, um, that comes from the um, consumer food uh, demand analysis analysis and sustainability. I think that's Center for Food Demand Analysis and Sustainability. That's it at Purdue, um, uh, which is a relatively um, new center. Uh, and they're doing some, uh, providing some nice um, estimates. These are kind of crude estimates, um, but basically what, uh, what these are is they're looking at um, the uh, average product of labor. So how much output um, per uh, worker, uh, manufacturing, food manufacturing, um, has on average, and then um, multiplying that by the number of um, expected cases of COVID in each of these industries. And so I've looked at this, I've added this up. So taking the data from their website, again, which you can access through the hyperlink, uh, I've added up um, for, the, uh, for the US and Ohio, um, what we're seeing uh, across these, um, these industries. So um, for the US, right, this is um, the last 365 days, okay, we see that the total vulnerable production, okay, you can see is up in the in the order of magnitude of billions of dollars, right? And, um, and actually, uh, well, meat processing has gotten a lot of attention, beverage manufacturing is actually um, the, the highest in terms of the total vulnerable production, according to these, um, these estimates. And you can see that um, every, uh, every sector is being affected um, when we look at food processing. When we look at Ohio, um, it's the dairy product manufacturing, beverage manufacturing, and then um, other kinds of specialty food manufacturing that are most affected. You see that animal slaughtering and processing is actually um, ranked fifth in terms of um, the total vulnerable production in Ohio. So I think that's important to recognize that um, Ohio um, might be a little uh, different. And when we sometimes read the national headlines, it's important to recognize what's unique about uh, production in the state. So what this is telling us is these are some of the um, kind of vulnerable industries where we might want to be particularly, pay particular attention to the way that worker um, uh, worker cases and um, worker absences might be affecting the industry and production. Okay, now the other thing I wanna emphasize here is that this um, COVID continues to impact workers. So this is looking at the last 30 days and I just pulled this a couple of days ago. Um, so we see that um, in the last 30 days um, in the US, um, animal slaughtering and processing has been kind of the most um, vulnerable. In Ohio, it continues to be dairy product manufacturing that, it, that leads here. Of course, just because we're looking at 30 days, the um, magnitude of these numbers is smaller. Um, but what's important to just note is that COVID continues to impact um, these, uh, these businesses and these supply chains. The other thing I want to mention here that I think is really important is that 
when we look at these vulnerable production um, calculations, um, which are crude but are useful in helping us to understand um, vulnerability, these only include worker cases of COVID. Now, the reason that's important is because there are a lot of folks, and you might be among them, um, that are being affected by COVID, not directly by actually coming down sick and having to be out of work, but because you have caregiving responsibilities uh, for folks either who have COVID-19 or who have been exposed to it. Um, anybody who has a kid in daycare or in uh, school right now knows that whenever there's an exposure, uh, there's a required quarantine and there's a lot of unpredictability for parents uh, and caregivers around that. Okay, so along with direct health impacts of COVID, it's a perfect storm in supply chains. Now, I know um, my colleague Ian Sheldon is going to talk globally about supply chains um, and might have a little bit of a different perspective on this, but here are some of the things that I think are important that are impacting um, our domestic markets and food system. First, again, I want to emphasize that consumer demand um, has increased, and this is good. This is a sign that we are um, in an economic recovery of the pandemic, but it does increase price levels and that's a little scary. There is also a container shortage, which I think Ian might talk about more, um, which was not specific to the pandemic, but is exacerbating issues. Interestingly, there's also um, uh, quite recently, I've been seeing um, an increase in warehouse demand and um, warehouse prices. This is due in part to an increase in e-commerce. So um, warehousing, because a lot of us are buying, maybe we're buying from Amazon or uh, buying from Chewy for our pets or other kinds of e-commerce uh, um, places. Um, and uh, in addition, we have um, this kind of stockpiling effect of consumers and concern by consumers is actually causing businesses to do the same. People want to, businesses want to make sure that they have inventory in stock um, for when you want it, especially leading into the holidays, because trust me, every business wants to be able to sell you the product that you want to buy from them. We also have a trucker shortage. Now, there has been a supposed trucker shortage literally my entire life. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. Um, but what's interesting right now is that just with many other situations, COVID is exposing and exacerbating issues that were already there. So with the trucker shortage, part of what we're seeing is that supply chain delays are a real problem in trucking because um, with truckers, you're getting paid for what you're hauling and the distance you're hauling, you're not getting paid for your time. And so what this means is that if you have to sit in a line at a port for hours and hours and hours, you're essentially not paid for that time. So that's a problem. Also, truckers have families. They have homes. Um, when we have unpredictability at home, people don't necessarily want to go on the road. And this can also um, be a challenge. Also, um, we should keep our, our eye on uh, potential port um, labor disputes. There's a lot of attention being paid to um, Long Beach um, and, and Los Angeles right now. Um, and some of the conversations there with the longshoremen who are the folks that are um, offloading uh, ships, um, they are um, going to be uh, um, negotiating a new contract uh, in summer 2022. So we should watch and for and kind of pay attention to that. And they are in a quite kind of strong position right now um, in terms of worker, uh, worker power. Um, they are, there's kind of a, a, a challenge as I understand it, and maybe Ian can weigh in on this too, um, that uh, ports in other places um, are uh, running 24 seven and more automated. Um, ports uh, the, in Los Angeles and Long Beach, we're seeing a little, a little less of that. Um, and some of our port operators are, um, are hesitant to um, increase hours of port workers um, in part due to strong wages in those industries. So um, there's some tensions there. I know that the Biden administration has been working to ease some of what's happening um, in ports. And of course, all of this is in the context of businesses trying to keep consumers happy, right? Businesses are trying to, like I said, every business that you wanna buy from, they wanna to sell to you, they want to be able to give you um, an item that you want quickly and in the condition that you want it. And so um, that's something that businesses are trying to adapt to. Okay, so besides higher prices, which I already mentioned, this leads to a couple of things. One thing is missing inputs and parts. Now, um, it may be that you might think, well, gosh, how does this affect um, domestic food and agriculture if we're not importing some of those goods? 
The way that this, uh, I think, affects our, our food and agricultural systems domestically is a little uh, subtle. And it's things like you need a new um, piece of machinery to increase the capacity of your processing facility, or you need um, personal protective equipment for your workers, or um, if you need a part for something and you didn't know until your machine broke that you needed that part, these are some of the things that might be in containers that are waiting offshore currently in California. So this is a challenge um, right now. Work stoppages continue to also be a challenge. Now, this is not just work stoppages domestically, but also work stoppages in other places which are contributing to some of our kind of um, supply chain issues. And then these issues also cause delivery delays. Now, for, um, for those of us who are saying, gosh, you know, I ordered this new thing on Amazon. It's not really that important to me. Um, so it's fine if I get it next week, that's fine. Not a big deal. But when this is school districts who are, working to provide snacks and lunches uh, for their students every day in their K through 12 schools around the United States, these delivery delays can be a real problem. And that is something that we have seen um, this year is delivery delays um, in those kinds of contexts where um, the, uh, the schools and the, the folks serving food are relying on um, delivery being very uh, precise and predictable. Okay, so let's um, let's switch gears a little bit uh, to talking about local food, um, which is a topic, um, as I said, um, that that I do some uh, some research on. So I just want to quickly um, review key trends in local and regional food systems in 2020. And I talked a lot about this last year, and you can see this in my talk. Um, there was a lot of kind of action in this space. So we saw a surge in local demand um, due to the kind of uh, this shock that we experienced from the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of people looked inward. They were interested in, gosh, what can I get locally? I'm concerned about being able to access food in the ways that I normally do. We also saw that, especially in the lockdown period, um, before folks um, went back to, um, to work in some kind of new normal, um, there was a lot more eating at home and we saw, we saw cooking, um, uh, folks cooking at home. There were also concerns uh, about, about shortages, okay, and this also contributed to that local demand. We did see an increase in online shopping, even for direct, um, direct marketed goods. So, um, you know, putting together an online order and then picking it up curbside or picking up a box at a farmer's market. We saw more of that pickup and delivery, and we saw real diversity in the local ordinances um, in terms of uh, how they affected farmer's markets and other types of um, direct marketing channels. For example, some farmer's markets didn't open at all during 2020, whereas others um, were following uh, strict kind of uh, local health guidelines and others were largely unaffected. So that really varied um, and uh, farmers and market managers um, and others had to adapt. So, uh, however, though, because of the surge in kind of interest in local, there was some expected strong local demand going into 2021. I would say I was a little bit um, less optimistic maybe than some, but I think in general, um, in our local food systems, people were really excited about how much um, excitement there was about local. Um, and, uh, and we're really feeling like, hey, people are starting to get what we've been saying all along. So what actually happened in 2021? Well, unfortunately, local demand moderated, right? Consumers forgot. Um, I like to say every month in the pandemic feels like a year. So there was basically, if you had say a farmer's market or a CSA and you shut down for four or five months, that might feel like four or five years in pandemic time. So the off season is a long time during a pandemic. And consumers really desire to return to normalcy. So interestingly, the timing of the pandemic early in 2020 was such that um, the local and seasonal kind of food markets were just kind of opening up. And so as the pandemic um, was kind of surging and first kind of coming on the scene in early 2020, there was this initial kind of interest in local food systems. People got into their 2020 patterns right then, right? They bought a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture Share, where they would get maybe a box every, every week, or they started going to a farmer's market and they built some of those habits in. 
but over the winter, we all hunkered down, right, this last year, um, and we really desired a return to normalcy. And frankly, we thought that there would be more of a return to normalcy uh, with the vaccine uh, rollout coming. So, um, so while some folks had tried things in 2020, um, there's really this desire for normalcy that's strong. And I think people have an exhaustion and they're trying to get back to something um, previous and they, and they kind of left their 2020 habits behind in 2021 um, because of just the, the shifting uh, norms. In addition, local and institutional demand grew slowly. So I don't think we're back to where folks thought we would be when we were forecasting in late 2020. Um, we still, um, because of the Delta variant in the summer, uh, continuing um, you know, numbers of, of COVID cases continuing to be high um, now, we still are not back to that point where people are eating out in the same ways. Now, what does that mean? That means that local uh, food producers and direct marketers who were selling to those channels are not yet seeing that uh, demand return to where it was. Um, costs were still high in 2021. So um, labor challenges have continued, as I um, said, with all of my red check marks, right? COVID-19 continues to take people away from work. Um, for both for direct and indirect kinds of reasons. Um, impact costs have started to rise for all the reasons that we've, uh, we've discussed um, already with supply chains and consumer prices. And then COVID-19 mitigation is still in place. So um, businesses have continued to face increased costs to mitigate, mitigate COVID-19 exposure for both workers and consumers. Now, a bright spot here for um, local and direct marketers is policy. So, um, of course, during this uh, during this period, since I talked to y'all last year, um, we have had a presidential election and we've had a change in administration. So the new administration is very interested in supporting small and medium enterprises and local and direct markets. As a couple of examples, um, uh, recently, uh, this summer, $400 million was dedicated to purchasing from local, regional, um, and socially disadvantaged farmers for distribution through food banks, as some of the work that the USDA does is commodity procurement from U.S. farmers to then provide um, for uh, low-income and food-insecure folks. Additionally, um, recently announced is $4 billion to strengthen domestic food systems, including processing, market development, and aggregation distribution. So um, this will come in the form of, of grants and loans and various, various programs uh, for producers. In addition, just this fall, um, there was a new micro farm insurance product introduced for producers involved in local and direct marketing. Now, this is a little, this is not specifically related to the new administration. This had been in the works um, for a while, um, but this rollout um, is another bright spot um, for local and direct marketers. Um, and so this is something that's available through the USDA's risk management agency. Another bright spot is that local is really in the spotlight. Despite um, this kind of moderating demand um, by consumers, there's a lot of conversation happening about food system resiliency. Now you may say, what is that? Great question. There is not agreement about what food system resiliency is and what exactly contributes to it, though I can tell you there's a heck of a lot of research happening around it. So the key question is, what can we do to make our food system more resilient? We have seen COVID-19 lay bare and some of the challenges and issues in our food system and exacerbate some of the things that were already there. Now, many people see local and regional food systems playing a role in this resiliency, because although we might lose some economies of scale um, and economies that might come from having a more kind of uh, concentrated and national or global food system, we gain distributed redundant networks of businesses um, that can um, come online or can, uh, can um, help move product um, if part of the system uh, is, not, is not working well or if there's a work, if there's a work stoppage or if there's um, some kind of reason uh, related to one of, the, one of the things we've seen, right, um, that a particular business uh, that handles a lot of product can't operate. Okay, now the new normal. All right, what is the new normal? The big challenge right now is um, pandemic, oh, I should say adaptation um, to uh, a sustainable new normal. So how do we go from just kind of Band-Aid fixes, right? Okay, we're just adapting in the moment. We're trying to do what we can right now to a sustainable new normal. It feels like we can breathe a little bit more. Um, well, let's talk about that. First, there's this key piece of capturing consumers. Many businesses saw new consumers in 2021. So people were trying things and seeing what sticks. Not everything is going to stick. 
okay, with consumers. Consumers try things in 2020, they're trying things in 2021. They're not gonna keep doing all of these things. But a key question for any business right now in food and ag space is how can we retain these consumers moving forward? So some key factors here, and I'm, these are gonna come up again and again for me, it's not, it's not a copy and paste error, is communication empathy and changing with evolving needs. Okay. So communicating with customers. Um, one of the things that I have seen, like I mentioned the, the um, issues when you have a seasonal food system, right. Where you only see your customers, uh, maybe April through October. Uh, if you don't touch base with them, October through that next April, you might lose them. So one key is just maintaining communication with your customers, right. Send them a holiday card. Um, Send them a newsletter, tell them what's happening on your farm, get them excited about re-engaging with you as soon as you can sell things in the spring. Empathizing, right? Recognizing we are all tired. As a business owner or as a business operator or manager, you might be tired, consumers are tired. And so um, kind of putting ourselves in the shoes of consumers is really important to understand where are they at, what do they need? And then changing with evolving needs. Unfortunately, things are going to continue to change. And so it takes not just saying, okay, now we're doing this thing, we've adapted, right? But actually continuing to find ways to get information from consumers and adapting to those needs uh, to be able to capture and retain the consumers that might have um, you might have had a single touch or, or a few touches with during the pandemic. Another key piece is recapturing consumers. Now, I think this is a particular challenge for things like restaurants, right? There are businesses that saw fewer consumers in 2021, like restaurants and other in-person venues, maybe some um, agritourism operators in 2020. I think um, they largely um, were in better shape coming into 2021. But how can businesses re-attract these consumers moving forward? So again, key factors, communication, empathy, changing with evolving needs. Also, there's kind of two tracks to this, right? There's one, which is, you know, uh, kind of back to what you love, right? We're back. We're, we're back with your favorite items. We're back with, um, with your favorite drink specials. We're back with your favorite um, menu items. So there's that kind of tack. And there's also the trying something new. And so um, th these are both kind of different strategic um, paths to explore or some combination of the two, right? Um, as things have changed. And I, I don't think people should be afraid to try something new um, because consumers have changed, right? Consumers, we've all gone through the ringer in this last um, year and a half. And so um, people might be open to something, to something new. Also investing in infrastructure. Um, of course, we had a, a large infrastructure uh, bill that was recently passed federally, um, but that's not what I'm talking about here necessarily, though that could come into play. What I'm talking about is um, short-term adaptations required short-term investments. So for example, a lot of folks um, move to, uh, to online sales um, in the direct marketing space and also in the kind of larger retail space, right? A lot of us were buying online and have moved to not as consumers. So um, one of the places where businesses might be thinking about investing in infrastructure would be digital infrastructure, right? Digital platforms. So how should businesses be thinking about this for the long term? Well, I think the first thing to recognize is it's important to take stock, right? It might have just been that beginning of the pandemic that, oh my gosh, we have to get online. We just have to get this going. And you went with the first or second vendor that you talked to, right? Now, the question now is, is this the right infrastructure moving forward? And so um, you might consider investing in more or different infrastructure, for example, different or, uh, for example, digital infrastructure, as you're able to financially um, after doing some research in this space, right? There's now a lot more information. There are some new products. Okay, it's important to take stock and reevaluate and not just say, okay, here's where we are. We're moving forward, um, but to see what is working and if it's working and where you want to invest for the long term. And finally, avoiding and mitigating burnout. I mentioned already that everybody is exhausted. Things are not back to normal for people and wishing does not make it so, unfortunately. And so how can businesses support workers? Well, there's some key factors here. Again, communicating, empathizing, and regularly assessing needs. Um, and I think being willing to try new things and to challenge widely and long held beliefs. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, I'm gonna give you an example that I heard the other day and I forget what the business was. I wish I could remember it um, so I could give them some credit. Um, but I was, um, I was reading about a business that said, you know, we're switching our customer service shifts. We used to have, it was a, a business where folks work from home doing customer service. 
And uh, that was one of the aspects of their business. And uh, so they said, we're allowing people to work from home who work in our customer service lines. And we're allowing, instead of just doing four hour shifts, we're also allowing them two hour shifts. Now you might think, gosh, what can you get done with two, in two hours? We're used to thinking about the eight hour workday with a small break in the middle, perhaps. Well, if you think about something like customer service, right, those are maybe five minute calls over and over and over again. So you just have a collection of small tasks. So essentially they just said, well, gosh, these are just batches of small tasks. We could have smaller batches of small tasks or larger batches of small tasks. So maybe you can't break up everything into two hour shifts, but this is something that actually allowed workers um, who maybe had some kids at home, needed to have a little bit more flexibility uh, to work in smaller chunks, which is something that they really valued. So again, this is something that we might not think of normally. And so it's important for us to challenge those kind of um, those norms to say, what can we do differently uh, to help support workers and to um, address, uh, I don't know if we can avoid burnout right now, but we can mitigate it. Okay, so what's next? Well, first, winter 2021, spring 2022, COVID-19 is gonna continue, right? We have continued supply chain issues in the US and around the world because of this and continued unpredictability, which continues to be a challenge. That said, there is hope on the horizon in my mind. One is due to continued um, vaccination uptake and introduction of therapeutics. So this would be like the Pfizer pill, which are treatments for COVID for those who already have it, as opposed to vaccines, which are preventative. And efforts to make vaccines and therapeutics available globally will help, right? We have issues like if there's a, uh, a factory that shuts down in China that makes um, computer chips that go into appliances that we use in the US, right? Those are the kinds of issues that um, even if we have good vaccine uh, kind of uptake um, and mitigate COVID issues in the US, we still have, um, if we, given that we have a global supply chain. So I think this provides hope on the horizon. Um, I think that consumer prices will moderate. We have a lot of concerns going into the holidays. Everyone wants to have uh, a kind of a, a plentiful uh, Thanksgiving um, and holiday table. Um, people want to be able to buy gifts uh, for various holidays for their family members. Um, and so once the winter holidays pass, I think there'll be some easing concerns uh, about shortages. Um, and I do think that supply chain backups will ease. Uh, we do in fact, have you know recent announcements that the Biden administration is working with the ports to, um, you know, uh, change working hours to um, find ways to address uh, port backups. So um, I do think that we will see some of that moderate. Summer 22 and beyond, um, we will see again continued economic recovery due to global vaccine and therapeutics rollout. I do think we'll see stabilizing inventories as businesses and consumers settle into a new normal, whatever that may be. There's also gonna be some exploration of new ideas and this always happens, um, but some of these will fail and that's that's normal, I think. And it's important to recognize that's not, um, that's not unique to the pandemic that some things that you try fail, it might just feel uh, that they might just feel like a particular sting right now um, when it's been such a challenging time, but we have to keep that in perspective. And then um, there'll be continued strong worker power due to optimism and economic growth. Um, I listened to a really interesting um, interview the other day with another economist, uh, uh, Justin Wolfers in Michigan. And, um, and he was he was kind of trying to uh, point to this difference between the, um, the recession in uh, 2008, and now um, the, uh, the kind of situation we have here, um, right now with with workers and, and, um, and unemployment. And he was pointing to the fact that, you know, workers, the reason that workers are holding out is that they're actually much more optimistic. So from a business perspective, you might say, gosh, it feels like there's a labor shortage, but in fact, workers are optimistic that they can find something better. And from a worker thinking about a labor standpoint, that's actually kind of a good thing. So um, that strong worker power, right, due to optimism and economic growth is going to um, cause a situation where people are, workers are going to continue to um, push to, um, renegotiate and rewrite some of the rules in labor markets. And so we're gonna to continue to see that. And I'm sure you'll hear much more about that um, from my colleague, um, Margaret Jodlowski in her talk. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. Thank you so much. And I look forward to your questions. Okay, thanks so much, Zoe. That was a fabulous talk and a, and a tour through a lot of different issues there. So, um, I would encourage uh, those of you that are still online, uh, uh, we have, I think 75 people are still online, which is excellent. 
if you would like to put a question to Zoe, if you would put it in the, the Q&A box, please. Uh, we'll be watching out for those questions. But um, as I was sitting listening to your presentation, Zoe, um, um, I will ask you a couple of questions. And yeah, my take on the supply chain is much more sort of a narrow one. It, you know, it focuses on um, commodity trade and how that has been affected by some different issues in global supply chains, but not, not so much the ones that you talked about. Mm -hmm. But I, you, you may not have read this article. It was a short essay in the New York Times yesterday. It was called The Supply Chain Crisis is a Labor Crisis. So you, you had a, some figures up that had lots of different things going on. So, and there was a very interesting um, line in the article that I'm just going to pick out. It says, Long before the ever given, that was the, that massive 220,000 ton container ship that blocked the Suez Canal back in March. We all remember seeing pictures on that. Um, the transport industries, um, and I'm just quoting from the New York mm -hmm. Times, issued a blunt public warning that a trade log jam was unavoidable if conditions for sailors, drivers, and pilots were not improved. So this article is um, basically pushing the point that this is very much a labor supply crisis. And now Margaret may have a, some things to, to talk about there, but how do you see, you know, if you were to weigh up what you talk about a perfect storm, mm -hmm. but if you, you know, done some statistical analysis, what, what would be your hunch about, is it labor supply? Is it, you know, what's, what's the biggest factor in, in driving these things, do you think? Right now. That's a great question. I haven't done the statistical analysis, so I hesitate to make a strong commitment. Um, I do think, I mean, again, I'm going to fall back on what I've said a lot during the, the um, pandemic, which is not, not specifically saying this is a labor supply, but rather that this is, that there's a, there's a COVID issue that's just exacerbating everything. And so I think that we are, um, despite despite being affected daily personally by covid we we continue to forget that it it impacts every part of the of the supply chain and not necessarily always in a kind of a, a labor supply kind of of, uh, of way in terms of of work um like you said work work stoppages but people are are thinking kind of differently uh, i think kind of about uh, about work so in that sense i would agree that there's a there's a labor supply component to it but really what we're seeing is that covid has laid bare i think like a, a, this is something i said earlier a variety of other issues in supply chains and so uh, i think putting it all onto labor supply i mean i I will continue to say, I do think it's a perfect storm. Putting it all on labor supply is not, I don't think is sufficient because we have many of these other kind of issues that were present in our food system and that these kind of uh, labor supply issues might and, and COVID issues might exacerbate. And so this is an opportunity for us to take a look at those and say, gosh, what are those? Um, let's address these so that when some of the labor issues that are exacerbating these go away, these are also being addressed. And so it's important for us to at least identify where those are, those various places are coming from so that we actively address them. Otherwise, we're just gonna say, oh gosh, we've taken care of COVID and then we're gonna forget about all the other things that still need investment and attention. Yeah, I mean, the reason I, I, I asked, and, and I'm gonna, I've got, we have some questions in the Q&A, but I just wanted to follow up. You mentioned yeah. Brexit <laughs> earlier. You know, Brexit's a, highly political issue in the UK still and there's a big debate going on whether it was the free movement of workers has mm -hmm. been stopped with Brexit is that is that the labor supply issue that's driving the supply chain issues in Britain and we have probably worse supply chain issues in Britain right now than we do here in the US or is it the pandemic and of course the politicians are seeking to blame the pandemic and uh, those who were against Brexit are seeking to blame Brexit. So, um, I, you know, it, it, everything's much more nuanced, of course, than than the way politicians present this. Anyway, I'm going to go to the quest, the Q and A. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Ben Ayres. Um, how much of the supply chain issues are tied to a breakdown of just-in-time inventory due to COVID? I think that's a great question, Ben. Um, I, you know, I've, I've heard some people say this, that the, the type of, of kind of supply chains we're operating in has fundamentally shifted. That, you know, as you might have 
though I didn't say it directly, um, I think I intended to. Um, so I'm glad you brought this up. We are, we are not operating in a just-in-time world right now. And that is very challenging because we have invested so much time and effort and infrastructure and process innovation um, into that just-in-time kind of uh, operation. And so, you know, part of what we're seeing, for example, I mentioned this demand for warehousing in the U.S. Part of what we're seeing is that, you know, with just-in-time inventory, you don't need as much warehousing because you're moving things through your warehouses more quickly, right? You don't need to hold as much at one time. So we are seeing that, um, that some of the unpredictability of demand and unpredictability of supply um, is causing folks who are in that distribution chain to really want to, um, to hedge and to hold more inventory. So we are not operating in a just-in-time inventory right now. And I do think that moving forward, there's gonna be attention to you know, what is, I mentioned resiliency, what is resiliency in terms of inventory? What, you know, maybe I think for a while people are going to be a little sensitive uh, to this and are probably going to be trying to, you know, hold a little bit more inventory than we were in kind of the leanest just in time period. Thanks, uh, Zoe. I, there's a com I think this is more of a comment, but I'll read it out. And it may be um, Margaret might be able to come back to this in her uh, discussion because it, it, it it's probably as much in her area of expertise as yours, mm -hmm. sorry, but I'll read the statement out and then we have yeah. one more question. So this is from Kathy Sponheim and it's related to the strong labor power issue. And mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of our struggles to find people to work on our farm and packing facility is a shortage of people wanting to work regardless of how much we offer to pay. This has forced many of our peers in agriculture go to H2A, um, well, because they've had to pay $20 an hour for manual labor, but uh, I can't quite follow that because they, they can get cheaper labor from Canada and Mexico. We see this as a part of the draw from local food, US grown food to heighten congestion at ports and borders. So I, I think um, that is a, a labor supply issue and about whether we use domestic labor versus um, immigrant labor. And I think Margaret may, may, may address some of those issues in her presentation earlier. But we have yeah. here. Oh, if you want to comment. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm going to leave most of that to Margaret, but I wanted to touch on something that you said before, Ian, because your question about is this all a labor supply issue, right? Um, so, you know, another pandemic or no, it's never been easy to work in our food system, right, as, a, as an employee. And I just want to emphasize that. Um, and, you know, this year, for example, besides COVID, one of the challenges we saw is we saw record heat. We saw, actually, we had some farm worker deaths in the Western United States um, due to record heat waves um, where folks were, you know, um, working to maintain our supply of fresh fruits and vegetables um, around the U.S. and, and for, for some export markets. And so, again, this is, um, that is another issue not related to COVID where um, any, then any kind of um, additional kind of challenges related to COVID were layered on top of that. So we have to recognize that there are these other pieces and not be entirely um, COVID, COVID focused. Yeah. Right. I mean, I know from reading in the, for the UK truck driver issue is um, we've lost a lot of truck drivers who are willing to come in from Eastern Europe, particularly Poland, Romania, Hungary to, to and work long hours. Um, but you, the, the pay is, you know, a lot of people have given up their truck driving licenses mm -hmm. in the UK because of pay, but not just because of pay issues, but conditions, as you just mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. lack of toilet facilities, lack of places to sleep when yep. you know, you're off the clock, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. I think you're right. The pandemic has sort of raised up a bunch of labor issues, infrastructure yes. issues that people in the industry have talked about, but pay, maybe politicians and others weren't paying attention to. So I have um, a question here from Devin Foote. And then one more from an anonymous attendee there. There's a, that's a big question. The last <laughs> Good note to end on though, yeah. <laughs> so can you share your thoughts on input costs for local food systems? Um, and I, this is mostly related to the current fertilizer propane fuel cost increases. How, I think that's a question about how's that gonna feed in yeah. food prices, I guess over the next six months as mm -hmm. opposed to currently. I, I do think it affects local food systems, and uh, I, th I think that was kind of the the um, the thrust of the questions. Um, because although you know, local does not necessarily mean you are doing you are seeing different inputs than our kind of um, uh, more globalized supply chain, right? And so we tend to think 
I mean, I think that we tend to think of local production and global production as, as very different, and they can be, but it's, um, but, you know, producers for local markets are still using a variety of inputs. Some might be producing organically, um, in which case there are still certain approved organic inputs that they can use and, and amendments, and then others um, might be producing um, with, uh, um, you know, maybe more a kind of more standard set of or set of kind of um, inputs that would be similar to what you would see in maybe a, a kind of more conventional supply chain. And so it really runs the gamut, but in, within local food production. Um, and so I think that you will um, you will see this um, in um, in local food systems. And one of the one of the challenges I think in particular for local food systems is that folks might be purchasing some of these inputs at retail, whereas in a global food system you might be able to get like a lower you might be able to pay lower input costs because you're purchasing in larger quantities. So the challenge for local food system, um, I think uh, local food producers is going to be that there will be some of these input cost increases. And for those inputs that they do use, they'll be seeing all of the delays and, and kind of increases in input prices that come with buying at retail. Okay, um, I've got two questions to come. I'm, I'm gonna read both of them out and mm -hmm. then uh, we're getting close to the uh, finishing time, yeah. but I'd like to, these questions to be out there and give you a chance to answer them. Thanks. Um, the big question I'm going to leave till last because it's maybe yeah. something <laughs> again throughout the next uh, today and and tomorrow. So USDA, this is from Carol Smathers. Um, mm -hmm. USDA did a huge reassessment of the cost of a nutritious diet in the US this year. According to the Thrifty Food Plan, a reference family of four can still eat a healthy diet for about $192 a week. So the question to you, Zoe, is what are your thoughts on whether families can still eat well? on a low budget. Um, and then the question from an anonymous attendee, and I'm gonna make this the last question that we mm -hmm. take, and it, it's the biggie, I guess. Um, I don't think I could answer this. <laughs> what is needed to overcome these supply chain issues? That's why I think that's a pretty big question. Yeah. <laughs> we're grappling with economists and logistics mm -hmm. folks. Yeah. So um, if you could just give a quick answer to the budget question and then, yep. You wanted to maybe give your top three reasons, the top three things you think we need to fix to, to solve these yeah. supply chain issues. Sure. So, um, so Carol, thanks for the question about the Thrifty Food Plan. Um, for those who are not familiar, the Thrifty Food Plan is the USDA kind of uh, budget on which SNAP, um, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, uh, benefits are, are based. So um, the level of benefits uh, is, is tied to this, um, this budget. Um, you know, there has been a lot of uh, attention to the Thrifty Food Plan because because there were a lot of um, critiques of it as not being sufficient, <laughs> um, and uh, and and there was a desire uh, by many to update that, and that's why we have seen this um, kind of reassessment. Um, I think it is, I think it is challenging. Um, it it remains. I mean, it remains challenging to be food insecure and to be poor in this country, right? I mean, like that's. I think a given, first of all. Um, and one of the things that is really difficult, I think, is that even if you are, um, uh, even if you could uh, eat well on a low budget, there is a, con what we call consumer search costs, right? You have to figure out where is it that I can purchase these various items um, most cheaply for my household, right? And so um, that consumer, that that search, that, that you know, um, the time, cost that it takes um, for folks to figure that out, to, to figure out, oh, who has the specials this week? Um, or, you know, if there are stockouts, right, where things are not on shelves, um, might be particularly challenging if you're used to certain patterns. That can be particularly challenging for folks who are low income and who have very um, uh, significant time constraints, right? So often what we see, you know, is that folks who are lower income are maybe working more jobs, they're working more hours, right? So um, those search costs are even more significant um, for folks. Um, so I would say that it's always a challenge. Um, and uh, this leads me to my next the answer for my next piece is how do we overcome some of these challenges? So um, one challenge, uh, and, and I know Carol, um, Carol knows this well, um, that, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm working on and thinking about is what are some of the kind of policies and programs that we can implement um, to uh, increase uh, food access uh, for folks um, in rural and urban areas in Ohio and beyond. Um, but uh, so, so 
programs, policies, those are great. I think that um, one thing, you know, we want to jump to a silver bullet always. We want there to be a silver bullet. I do want to say, I think there's a there's a um, need to be cautious and not overcorrect at this time um, with some uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of policy. And what I mean by that is that um, I do think that there's a need for some some patience. Um, at the same time, um, some of the things that I think can address these issues are they're numerous and they're not glamorous. <laughs> um, for example, um, you know, some of the conversations we're seeing around, you know, um, infrastructure at ports and labor at ports. Um, these are longstanding conversations, right? Longstanding issues. Some of what we're seeing with truck drivers um, and, you know, adjustments in, in trucking. Um, it's not going to be an overnight silver bullet kind of thing to address the trucking industry. It's going to take some strategic thinking about what, how do we pay truckers, right? How do we, how do we um, change the length of those lines? And there's some things like, like zoning that matter. For example, how high you can stack containers in a lot in LA, right? Those, those small things matter and those small things have added up. And so along with thinking about, you know, the infrastructure bill that was just passed and some of the major things that we can do to, to reinvest in our economy in a big way, including in food systems, I think we really have to pay attention of what are the policies and, um, and issues that are creating small constraints for people and that are compounding and that are revealed by this. And so I think it takes a multi-pronged approach in coming at it from all sides so that hopefully we're better prepared for the next disaster or disruption. Well, I think I'm going to draw this session to a close, but just make uh, an observation, and that is that after the financial crisis, um, international economists took a long look at what happened to the complexity of, of, of value chains and supply chains. And what we saw was a slowdown in the expansion of supply chains, and, and that pretty much correlated with a slowdown in, in global trade. But we didn't see much. There was very little evidence for what's called reshoring. So businesses that are, and we're talking not just about food, we're talking about manufacturing, that there's a very high fixed and sunk cost to having invested in, in offshoring facilities and mm -hmm. offshoring marketing um, um, value chains and supply chains. And that's something that I think economists are going to be watching pretty carefully is, is the pandemic exacerbating some problems that are mostly related to infrastructure and transportation systems, or well, how much of it is firms are gonna rethink their whole offshoring strategies. The, the issue is right now, I think businesses are likely holding off because this is a significant reinvestment mm -hmm. to, move, to move back either onshore or closer to shore, if you wanna use that sort of metaphor. Mm -hmm. And I think it's too early to say whether we're going to see significant restructuring of global value chains. I, I think we're going to see adaptation, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure how much reshoring. I think a lot of those industries have been offshored for good and it's too costly to bring them back. But that's me making a forecast. You can come and ask me 10 years from now when I've <laughs> whether I got it right. So I'd love to thank Zoe so much for a great presentation and for the great questions we got from the audience.